Today I am joined by Jade Simmons, concert pianist and business entrepreneur. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. So, you have created a career by both being a performer and a musician. Um, after getting a great music education from Northwestern and Rice, how did you learn or where did you learn your entrepreneurial skills? <laughs> well, I think you know how they say necessity is the, is the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think like most serious music students, you assume that, you know, the cream always rises to the top and if you're just the best and you practice hard enough that a career will happen. Mm -hmm. And you get to school and realize that everybody's really good. Yeah. Um, so the goal starts to be how do I define myself? How do I make myself stand out in this crowd of superior musicians? Um, and I think when I got out of graduate school, you know, it kind of hits you that you've got this great education on how to play this amazing music, but no one's really taught us how to make a career. Now, Eastman, I should say, has been kind of ahead of the curve for probably over 15 years now as far as really thinking about the career piece. But for me, it was kind of getting out a lot of trial by error, um, and after about four years of making a career for myself, being um, unexpectedly in many ways very successful with, without a manager, uh, without that kind of designated career path, um, figuring things out and then deciding that I wanted to kind of clue other artists in onto, into all the things that I wish I'd known. Yeah. So I've been lucky in some sense and then uh, I guess really committed to the idea that, you know, it's not just about being a musician, mm -hmm. I have to find a business piece that goes with it. Mm -hmm. And how do you think that colleges can change to teach more of the business side and teach musicians how to go out and be their own boss? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, in all fairness, there are schools that are jumping on board now and there are schools that have been doing some really great things. SMU, I had no idea, has this amazing you know, division um, that centers on arts management and arts entrepreneurship. Now, the management piece has been around for a while at some schools, but this idea of embracing the fact that we really are self-employed. I mean, here we are at the Self-Employment and the Arts Conference. Um, and I don't think years ago we were okay with using those terms. So I think there has to be kind of permission given, especially to undergrads, um, that yes, while we should be singularly focused on our art, we have to give some kind of forethought. Um, and whether that's by way of arts management classes or just, again, by having your major professor say, have you given some thought um, to what kind of career you want to have. And I think there should be some focused um, time devoted to helping young artists decide what success is really going to mean. Mm -hmm. You know, in the world of classical, especially as a bassoon player, it's kind of like, well, there's orchestral jobs, there's teaching, and there's professorship I could probably maybe have mm -hmm. if enough professors <laughs> go away <laughs> and yeah. job openings open up. Yeah. So I think there has to be some permission given. Um, to allow students to think of themselves as small businesses and artistic products. Uh -huh. um, how do you balance business and performing? You know, balance is such an elusive word. I'm starting to think that it doesn't really exist. But what I do believe in is strategically juggling the different facets of your career. Uh, for me, being out of school now for a while, um, you know, I've founded a nonprofit, I have my performance career, I'm married and I have a child. Um, and you know, you want the days where you can just, as we used to say, woodshed it, practice for 12 hours a day and have no one interrupt you and come out and be ready. So there's this idea of what do I need and what season of my career am I in? Am I in the heavy performance season? which means I have to alert my family and my friends and say, look, I love you to death, but this is going to be about a three-week stretch here where I need to practice six hours a day. Um, and then there are going to be seasons when you, you need rest or when you need to spend uh, doing almost more promotion than you're doing practicing. So I think understanding what career period you're in and then strategically organizing your day mm -hmm. around getting very specific goals done. Mm -hmm. um, I saw in your book, your mantra is, don't wait around to be discovered, discover yourself. What does that mean to you? Well, it's two things. Don't wait around to be discovered really is because, like I said in the beginning, many of us as music students, you know, we were told pretty much one thing, practice makes perfect, and if you practice hard, you know, the world will recognize you. And you realize pretty quickly that everybody's doing that, so we can't all be recognized. 
Um, so instead of waiting on that knock on the door, you know, that phone call from the director of the New York Philharmonic, instead of waiting on that, what can I do to put myself out there? Um, at the conference here, we've had a chance to have one-on-one -on -one sessions with artists. And when I ask them what they want to do, what their dream career is, they immediately begin by listing all the things that will keep them from having a dream career. Mm -hmm. So we have kind of a habit of being very practical, very logical, um, and almost immediately kind of negating what we really want. And I think an artist, in order to discover themselves, and to find their true artistic identity, has to be very honest about what they envision their career looking like. You know, what does your career feel like in the morning, in the afternoon? What are you doing in your career at nighttime? Admitting that and then working backwards uh, in order to get to where you want to be. Um, and I want to be uh, very candid in saying this is probably the most difficult profession you can pursue in many ways. And I think once we admit that, then we can commit to the hard work and not be, you know, embittered by it. Yeah, definitely. You have done lots of outreach programs with kids and different presentations all across the country. Sure. Um, at Eastman, we also have a chamber music outreach program, and every year they bring in one example. Uh, this year they brought in the Imani Winds. That's right. Sure. And so we usually get to see one or two examples before we go out, but we don't really have any skills or role models every day to learn from. Sure. Um, what's some advice that you can give to students wanting to go out and do outreach programs, especially geared towards kids? Yeah, I think when kids are concerned, you have to understand that kids have the most amazing, as we used to say, BS radars, mm -hmm. right? So if you're not committed to what you're trying to give them in that outreach, they see through it. And you know, everyone has, especially the lay public, has a certain impression of what classical music is or concert music. So you are kind of going in. Um, against that stereotype, but I say pretend in a way that it doesn't exist, that you're just presenting music that you're passionate about. Well, kids respond to that. I think you have to have um, a mission other than I'm just going to go in and play this music and hope they get it. Mm -hmm. You have to have an end result. For me, uh, I want kids to understand that there's emotion in music that they can respond to even if they don't recognize this piece by Mozart. Yeah. Um, and they always respond to that. And then I think when you're crafting an outreach program, it should look and feel like you. So if you're taking stock of what your strengths and weaknesses or what moves you about the music, I would focus on that. Don't go in and give a history lesson. None of us even enjoyed our music history <laughs> classes for the most part. Sorry, yeah. professors. Uh, so don't take that kind of approach with kids, but go from you know that base level of this is music that moves me. Uh, this is why I've always been moved and I want to share my story with you. Uh, and Monty Wins is probably, wow, one of the number one presenters of outreach. I mean, their programs are captivating from beginning to end. Um, and they don't go in with anything to prove, they just go to share. Uh -huh. Kids respond. Yeah. And that kind of leads to my next question. You have built your recent career on doing all this new music, uh, you're doing the Rhythm Project, mm -hmm. and I think that it's really cool that you're taking all this new stuff and kind of mixing it with the old sure. the Bach and the Mozart. <laughs> Can you tell our viewers a little bit about how you've done this and you know what motivates you to present this stuff to a new audience and bring in new audiences? Sure. Well, there are a couple of motivators, and the first one that I think most artists ignore um, is that they should be a motivator for themselves. Our personalities, what makes us tick believe it or not, should go into our performance presentations. And so I've always been a person who's been good at telling stories. So I tell stories in my concerts about the music or about how I relate to the music or what I would like the audience to get from the music. Never feels like a do that for the most part, but it feels like an experience. So I talk a lot about crafting experiences. And in my experience, music has been um, a variety of things. I mean, I grew up listening to hip-hop and, and rap and R&B, but I was also in the youth symphony and like you, I was in marching band and I was conducting and I was in the drum line uh, and my father plays African drum, uh, drums. So I grew up with this thread of rhythm uh, that kind of went throughout my childhood, uh, my young adult life until today. <laughs> so it kind of hit me a couple years ago, why am I separating all these pieces? Is there a way for me to pull together all my interests and present an experience that people would enjoy. And I think um, 
our generation, your generation especially, you know, we've grown up with this kind of this iPod generation where everybody listens to just about everything. You can't judge a book by its cover anymore, which means that we have the opportunity to have an audience that listens to everything, which means our audiences are going to be more diverse um, when it comes to age and when it comes to ethnicity. So to me, it's an exciting time to be making music. And, uh, and I think we have to kind of take away the labels a little bit. Um, I used to fight very hard to be called a classical pianist because I spent all this time and energy on it. And now I'm telling myself, you know, I'm a pianist who plays, who's classically trained, plays mostly classical music, and I'm stretching my limits a bit and my audience is seem to be coming. Mm -hmm. What are some of the tactics that you use to find new audiences mm -hmm. and bring new audiences in? You know, that's something that we're really working on at Eastman. Sure. How do we get the audience more engaged? And I think that kind of goes along with uh, what you just answered. But I don't know, marketing strategy. Sure, or sure. Well, I think you know, you say you're doing it at Eastman. Every arts organization now is trying to find out how do we find new audiences. And I think the key is not to look for new audiences, but to look for your audience. Mm -hmm. um, so the early part of my career, when I was under management, you know, as a as a young artist, there's a there's a season where you should be saying yes to everything. Yes, I'll play that gig. Sure, I can do that. Even if you can't, and you go learn how to do it, you do it. Um, and then there's a period when you have to start paring down and saying, this is what I really do best. Mm -hmm. And when you're putting your best foot forward, you're presenting your music, you know, even if there are pieces that uh, the Barber Sonata for me. When I heard that, I was like, oh my gosh, Barbara doesn't know it. He doesn't know me, but that's my piece. Like, he wrote that for me. Um, and on my first CD, Revolutionary Rhythm, it has his sonata, some works by Curliano, some works for electronics and piano, and the, and the unifying thread is rhythm. It's called Revolutionary Rhythm. And I think uh, the key for me is saying, this is my artistic brand. There's this rhythm piece, there's this modern piece. And when you put that out there authentically, the people who like that gravitate towards it, and then they tell everybody else about it. I think, you know, symphonies have a harder time because they have a traditional audience they have to cater to first, mm -hmm. because that's their, you know, their mainstay. But young artists as individuals can dare, especially when you're in school, mm -hmm. to start looking for your tribe, you know, yeah. um, and finding that group that already likes what, what you do. Mm -hmm. And of course, social media and all these platforms are great for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I've seen on your website that you have kind of incorporated fashion oh, wow. <laughs> into your music too. Yeah. Uh, that's just kind of one of my personal interests. Sure. I just wanted to see how you have done that. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because, again, when you're in uh, something that has at least a conservative veneer as classical music, you get worried that if you talk about things as commercial or trivial as fashion um, or marketing, profit because these are words that we sometimes shy away from you get worried that people aren't going to take you seriously mm -hmm. but here you are a very serious uh, trained musician saying I relate to the fashion piece mm -hmm. and so it took a bit of understanding wait I can't be the only person yeah. that actually thinks about what I'm going to wear on stage I can't be the only person I can't be the only woman who loves music and is also moved by this thing mm -hmm. um, so it was a bit of taking a risk but doing things um, that were kind of what I call a slow reveal. So I did spend a few years where I was very focused on presenting myself in a certain way so people understood what my main product was. Mm -hmm. I'm a concert pianist and I present amazing music. Mm -hmm. um, now, what I wore on stage is just what I wore on stage. People began to notice that. They would ask me about that. So then all of a sudden it came up in interviews. I also have the background of being in the Miss America pageant. So I could never escape it even if I wanted yeah. to. Um, but that and, and other interests that I had, visual art or psychology, began to be things that I would put into my concert experience. Mm -hmm. um, and the fashion piece was, um, I'm allowed to do it because of today's reality culture. Yeah. You know, people wanted to see me not just on stage, but then they were curious about what was going on um, off stage. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they would go catch me on one of my many websites where I'm in sweats and like a <laughs> bandana and I'm working inside the piano trying to find new sounds and mm -hmm. other times they'll see my hairstylist giving me some really funky new do and people who may not have tuned in for the music tuned in for that and then they say now oh, what's all the stuff that she does and then they come in for the music so it's these nice kind of series of back doors just ways to bring in your audience that didn't even know you existed and now they know
Definitely. Yeah. And to kind of finish up, what is one piece of advice that you could give to our viewers, especially the young college aspiring musicians, mm -hmm. that they should really need to know? I think that even as an undergraduate, and especially as a graduate student, you have to commit to this idea of being the boss of your own art. I know we all want some really great manager to swoop in and get us, and they might, um, and we want presenters to all hire us, but I think you have to commit to understanding it's going to be you who shapes the kind of art that you're going to create. And in these years in school, the best thing you could do is to start taking stock of your strengths and weaknesses um, and be really honest with yourself about what you see yourself doing. Um, there's no better way to be prepared than to be honest uh, about what you want to do. And then you can go about making it happen. Great. Thank you so much for joining Thank you for having me, Kelly.